Welcome to Crownsman Agriculture, everybody. I'm your host, Jared Downey. We are getting into more episodes of Ag. It's exciting. We've had a great following from you, the agriculture sector. Um, thanks to MNP, where we've got to launch a new series. So we're going to be hopefully releasing at least 40 episodes over the next year. It's going to be fun. Uh, it's going to be lots of fun. There's going to be a lot of great guests. We've already got some lined up. Today, we're going to have Jason Steinle from, he is the VP of Dutch of Sales at Dutch Industries. Not starting off well, guys. Um, and Jason's going to be walking us through their product, how their company is set up, talk a little bit about just the adjustments made in the last year, um, a little bit of his background in the agriculture sector, lots of fun stuff to cover. Before we do that, we've got to hand it over to us, uh, to Gaudi Molina for our sponsors. Alrighty, so today we have Mino. Mino works closely with customers to make biochar from their waste streams. This biochar is then used to increase agricultural yields, to improve forest productivity, or to store carbon in materials such as concrete or asphalt. Through the production and increased use of biochar, Mino's goal is to accelerate the rate at which humanity removes carbon from the atmosphere, improves the health of soil and water resources, and in the process, creates the good jobs of the future. Learn more at minocarbon.com, or you can check out our Crownsman Agriculture interview with Mino CEO, Thor Kalistad. Of course, we also have SolarSet. Introducing the SolarSet Fold, the new foldable frame solar system brings power to your residential and commercial property and can be shipped worldwide. Like all SolarSet products, this sol the SolarSet Fold comes turnkey, pre-assembled, and is easily transported and installed. Learn more about the SolarSet Fold and their full line of amazing solar systems at SolarSet.com. Okay, thank you very much, Gaudi. Hello, Jason. Welcome to Crownsman Agriculture. It's great to have you on. Hey, thanks, Jared. It's good to be here. Um, I've actually, I, I was on your YouTube channel. You've, you've got quite a bit of good content out there. Um, have you got a chance to do many of these long form interviews? Um, I'm not long form, uh, just a few kind of smaller ones, generally at trade shows over the years. But, uh, but yeah, this, uh, this might be my longest. So <laughs> I'll try not to draw it out too, too long, <laughs> but you've, um, yeah, no, I, I, there's some interesting stuff you've done because I, I like it when I, I see companies that sort of leverage some of the same tools that we are. I mean, you've got some training videos out there. I, I saw one that's got like 15,000 views on it or something. Um, that's, that's pretty helpful when you sort of connect online with your customers. They can actually walk, get walked through how to deal with your products, hey? Yeah, we're kind of looking at some of the frequently asked questions that we get from uh, from producers out there. And uh, some of our stuff is, uh, you know, there's five or six different pieces that go together. And there's, yeah. uh, there's a handful of different factors that play into uh, making sure that you've got that opener installed correctly and it's functioning properly. And so, uh, so we went through a few different things like, you know, how to install a roll pin, how to remove it, uh, how to, uh, you know, properly install that opener kind of from top to bottom checking your shank angles to make sure that everything's uh, aligned and uh, running at the proper angles and uh, to get the best possible results. Right. So, well, it's, it's really nicely done too. It's, it's very professional and it's, it's laid out like even just saying, these are the tools you'll need before, which is what drives me nuts with instructions when it's like yeah. halfway through and you go, well, I'm, I don't have that tool and it's 10 kilometers away. <laughs> so no, yeah, it's nicely done. Yeah, it's been important to us, right? Like, uh, it's uh, it kind of takes me back to the weekend when uh, I was installing a ceiling fan with uh, with my wife, and uh, you kind of, you know, the instructions don't always come out right off the bat until you get stuck, and then uh, and then now yeah, it's yeah, time yeah. to pull it back out and then reverse five steps and uh, and then figure out where you kind of went sideways. So, so yeah, that, the farmers are pretty hands on guys, right? And so yeah. uh, it, it's nice to have something to just to, to look at as a resource, and in opposed to just having to kind of read through it. If you can watch somebody do it then uh, I always find it's a little easier, right? So, yeah, it's, um, I, I want to jump into, to sort of what Dutch Industries is the couple, we're going to focus on your agriculture section, uh, sector for sure. But um, can you just give us a setup, Jason, of, of who the company is a little bit of the background, just so uh, the audience understands who we're talking about here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the company itself uh, started, uh, officially started in 1950. Uh, Peter Cousson uh, came over from Holland on his own to kind of, you know, scope out Canada. It was, you know, at that time it was post-war uh, in Holland. Uh, things weren't necessarily as, as good as they have been and uh, looking for better opportunities for the family and for the kids, right? And so, uh, so he came over on his own and uh, kind of got his bearings and uh, got into, uh, into that Regina area and then uh, brought the family over, uh, you know, a few months later and then cut, uh, 
started Dutch Industries. Well, I guess it would have been Dutch blacksmith shop in 1952, and that would have been in uh, downtown Regina. So uh, yeah, at that time, it was kind of general blacksmithing uh, kind of duties, we were working for farmers, uh, you know, anything kind of fabricated and manufactured out of out of metal or out of steel. They uh, they were pretty involved in that. And, uh, you know, over time, the company evolved and, uh, you know, there was uh, the some children brought into the company and uh, and in 1967 Isaac uh, Isaac Cousin took over uh, with uh, with his uh, his cousin Fritz at that time and uh, so those two kind of moved uh, moved together until the late 80s where uh, Fritz had moved on and then uh, as it sits now we uh, they, they've transitioned a little bit around Regina moved into some larger buildings as the business grew and uh, they needed more more space and more capacity and then uh, and then in the uh, late 80s, moved out to uh, to Pilot Butte, Saskatchewan, and that's where we reside today. So we've got, uh, uh, I think we're sitting on uh, around 30 acres out there. Um, we've got uh, just short of a 70,000 square foot facility. Um, wow. It's, uh, yeah, and so it, the, 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 the kind of the bedroom community has, has served us well, right? It's, it's nice to be kind of right right in the city but there's uh there's definitely some perks to being uh just outside and uh, you know allowing you a little bit more room and uh, a little more flexibility that way and it's uh yeah it served us really well so so it's still it's still family involved in it then yeah absolutely uh the the general manager and president uh as of today is uh is greg cruson and that's isaac's son so well you know yeah. it, it's funny there's there's these 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 stats out there about and it's, it's actually they're actually not great stats of multi-generational businesses um, but yet so many, I mean, like, I, I don't know what the percentage is, but so many of the companies that have been on our show throughout the last few years have been multi-generational companies. And we've seen the next generation that's just so engaged um, with building up the business. Is it sort of, you know, just when you're working for a company like that, does it, does it, it does have a different feel, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, and I've worked for some larger corporations over the years, uh, um, you know, and some even smaller kind of mom and pop uh, companies. And uh, one thing I kind of liken it to is, uh, is what we see in farming, right? Farming is a, is a generational, uh, um, um, you know, a generational thing. I, I look at back at my family, they, uh, you know, they immigrated to Canada in 1913, uh, set up their plot, and we still, uh, to this day, have the, uh, you know, the original homestead is in the family, uh, the generations moved on. My father was uh, was third generation in that uh, in that farming family as well, and so it's uh, it's it, it's kind of a lifestyle thing. And I guess you get into the grain belt, you you uh, you see a lot of that not only in farms but in, in companies as well, like you mentioned, Jared. So, yeah, it's 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 uh, there's something very very beautiful about it. There's really no other uh, no other word to describe it. Sort of that that yeah, culture that it, it is it. right, and a lot of it I think ties into kind of being born into a, a bit of a way of life. Right. And, yeah. uh, and then you just tend to carry that on uh, through the generations. It's, it's what, you know, it's what you're familiar with and it's kind of where your comfort zone is. Right. So. Yeah. Well, I, I grew up with, uh, with basically with horses and cows, but then all the ranchers were all around us. So I was always on the outside, but I I've carried, carried my fair, fair share of irrigation pipes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's talk about the setup. So, okay, so you've got uh, Dutch Industries, but then there's Dutch Agriculture, and that makes up a huge portion of your company. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, kind of under that Dutch Agriculture uh, window, we have uh, we have our openers. So, we have the Dutch Opener Division, um, and that basically is tillage tools uh, designed for uh, for the purpose of uh, bolting on to um, different different seeding tools and and used to place the seed and fertilizer in the ground. And then from there, we have uh, Another thing that's kind of unique to Dutch uh, is uh, we build custom cab filters to um, filter the air coming into the cab on a tractor. And uh, what it does is it kind of it uses activated charcoal to carb uh, to basically filter out the uh, any harmful chemicals. And then uh, we also have another option uh, which is, is which is called Amogram, and that filters out uh, the fumes from ammonia and hydrous, and uh, that stuff can be uh, well deadly at times. And so. You want to keep that out of the cab of the tractor, so uh, so we use that uh, to do, to do that. Um, we built uh, we build crop lifters on that side as well, and uh, those are uh, you know depending on the year and what uh, what kind of uh, I guess how Mother Nature's acting out there. Uh, some some years are are uh, are better than others for those, but other uh, other things that we build that is a big part of that uh, that egg sector is our Dutch bio spreader. So 
Um, we build two different uh, sizes of, of manure spreaders um, that go from 12 all the way up to 21 ton capacity. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of a history kind of behind why we got into that. And, uh, and it's, it served as a real nice transition uh, for us uh, as, a, as kind of a full-fledged product in our egg lineup. So Actually, uh, that's, you said about the history, and I was going to ask about the, because your products, there's obviously a correlation between them, but they're also very separate. So I was curious of sort of what the backstory is of how you got into those, you know, the, the filter, the spreader, and, you know, the, those, you know, those multiple products. How did that come on board? Yeah, and so a lot of it, well, a lot of it is farmer driven at the end of the day, right? Uh, a lot of our innovations come from ideas of how, how we could do things better, right? If you're a producer looking at your farm, what, what do you like? What don't you like? Uh, what do you, what do you wish you had? And, uh, and how does that transfer uh, into, you know, companies like us taking that information and, and uh, using that to innovate products to, to help these guys out. Right. So uh, I, I guess starting with the bow spreader, our history there uh, started uh, you know, back about, uh, you know, say 10, 11 years ago, we were, we were tied in with, uh, with a large uh, overseas company and we were um, we, we had a partnership with them for around seven years um, building manure spreaders for them we were we were uh, manufacturing for the for the North American market and then we also also kind of had a, a joint uh, distribution partnership with those guys and uh, um, when that partnership uh, kind of took a bit of a different direction we uh, you know we had been building spreaders for seven years and and you know building a lot of spreaders you know and and multiple different sizes for different different applications and kind of got to a point where uh when the partnership uh went went in a different way we thought well hey we we know a fair amount about this we uh we know what we liked about the ones that we were building they weren't necessarily our design but uh but we also know what we didn't like and what we thought we could do better right so at that point we uh we kind of enlisted the help of uh, of, uh, of our own engineering group that were heavily involved in in that side of the of the company, and then we uh, we also enlisted a little outside help to uh, to kind of help point us in the right direction. Um, spoke to quite a few producers over the years uh, of what they liked, what they didn't like, and what they'd like to see, and uh, and that kind of spawned the uh, the Dutch bow spreader. And so we we built it out of fairly heavy material. We uh, um, we're kind of known as, as, uh, as, you know, maybe a, a little bit as overbuilding in the industry, right? You build something a little heavier than you need it to be just to ensure that, uh, these guys aren't going to have any issues with it when they, uh, when they need to rely on it, uh, you know, kind of in, in the season, right? So. So that heavy, that, that, that heavy build sort of, you know, get, getting known for that. Does that, is it, is it specialty then? Is it where there's certain situations, a certain terrain and things like that? Or what, what's the situation where someone comes to you and says, no, this is, I specifically need your type of build. Well, if you look at uh, kind of manure spreading, it's not, it's not a real heavily used machine on the yard, uh, on the farm, but when you need it, you need it to function well. Right. And right. so let's just say you're out there and you're, you're cleaning all your corrals and, uh, you know, sometimes there's uh, there's fence posts in there. There's chunks of concrete, right? And uh, you know, you've got two vertical beaters spinning at 420 RPM on the back end. That um, when these uh, large objects come through, we uh, we have to uh, kind of build the. You know, it's not we, we don't guys don't want to be spreading uh, you know uh, fence posts and, and concrete and other things like that, railway ties. But it's stuff that gets mixed in there. You don't necessarily notice it. Now that that is coming through the back end of this machine and uh, there's vulnerable components if they're built too light to handle worst case scenario, I guess would be a good way to explain it. So we uh, we tend to over overbuild on that side of things to you know to try and prevent guys from having issues when they need to rely on that equipment. Right. And uh, wh where I kind of know that we're on the right track is when you when you when you start taking this machine around the trade shows and you and you're. And you've got guys that uh, that maybe aren't in the market for a machine, but they're in that business. And they walk by the booth and they have a look at it, and uh, they kind of start walking around. And you know, if you're using it on a on a fairly regular basis, you know the things that you like about the machine that you've got at home. You know the things that you don't like, right? So what you kind of look at when you're walking around our machine is okay. I want to see did they beef this up because this has been a problem on my machine. Is this heavier? You know, is this is this design better? Um, and so when they start touring around the machine and you can kind of go through the ins and outs of it and what we've done to, uh, to get it to where it is today, 
they they appreciate that, right? They see that and they say, okay, yeah, you you've addressed, you know, areas that we've had problems with, and uh, and you know, we like the look of what we see, and uh, gives you an opportunity to uh, you know maybe turn that into a sale and uh, and a, and a new customer, you know, down the road, right? So it's it's um, you know, I was actually just talking to my wife the other day about because we were we were getting into new car and and things like that, so we were looking at reviews, and I you know was looking through the top of what cars have resale value and stuff. And I, I said, I wonder, I wonder if these like top CEOs of these major car manufacturers, you know, I wonder if they, you know, what it, do they actually feel that personal pride of having, you know, being at the top of a company that has, that has the best resale value. Mm. Um, but of course other cars have other, you know, they have the smoothest ride. And so everybody sort of has their thing. Um, is that, is that sort of at the core? I know it's just sort of a, a simple question. Yeah. Is that that sort of next tier of of heavy duty? Is that sort of a core thing? I mean, in other words, has it ever been suggested to hey, let's let's lighten this up, let's let's try to get into that space, let's punch out a million of these things? Yeah. Has that been discussed and then go, no, we're gonna stick on this path? You know, it's uh a lot of that stuff, uh, manufacturing is a bit of a, a funny, uh, a funny thing because when it, when it comes down to that, Jared, you, you're looking at your machine and you're thinking, okay, uh, you're, you're always trying to be as efficient as you can when it comes to manufacturing, right? And so when we're uh, when we're looking at this stuff, we we you know we look at options to try and reduce costs, right? But I think uh, the best way to go about that, and what we've done is we we've, we've tested them, right? So we take them. You know, maybe we want to build this a little bit lighter that would save, you know, X amount of dollars when it comes to manufacturing this machine. Um, we take it, we, we put it in the hands of the producer, you know, put this thing through the paces, give it everything that you would normally, uh, you know, uh, use your machine for. And then uh, let's, let's work together with these guys and understand how this stuff functions. And so, you know, we, through that testing, we've actually, we've looked at a few different options and then we've gone out, saw the results. And said, okay, that's not going to work, right? Um, sometimes there's, uh, there's, you know, there's, you know, look at the floor chain. I guess is a good example on our machine, right? Uh, on a 14 ton machine, we we use a three quarter inch 80 grade logging chain, and that has like a 112 thousand pound breaking strength. Well, there's no way you're you're going to break that chain inside of a uh, of manure spreader. Um, you probably don't need that level of chain on your manure spreader. But so we've tested uh, smaller versions of that. Um, we found them to be suitable, but um, when I'm a producer and I kind of climb into the back of that uh, manure spreader at a trade show just to kind of have a look at the floor slats and the inside of the box of it, yeah. I, if I look down and I see a, a very, you know, a, a noticeably heavy chain, that resonates with me, man. Like that probably doesn't need to be that heavy. Uh, but if I'm looking at that and I'm I'm a producer, I'm thinking, okay, if if, if they're kind of overbuilding that and they're you know, they're using yeah. something larger than what they need that translates into the rest of the machine. Right. And so, uh, yeah, sometimes manufacturing costs get a little higher than, than you would like, but in the same breath, it's, uh, I, I would rather build something heavier and, and have that, uh, that producer go out, use it in the field. And if, if something gets in there and has to go through that, uh, that isn't necessarily designed, you know, it's not what it's designed for. I want that machine to be able to take it. I want the producer to be able to keep on going and not have to stop, be down for repairs. And, uh, you know, it kind of actually, it leads me to a bit of a funny story when we got, uh, you know, we, we, there's uh, a lot of uh, um, different hutter colonies out here have fairly uh, large cattle operations. And, uh, and, and we, we often get the question at trade shows, well, how does this thing handle stones? How does it handle stones? Right. And, and it kept coming up and it kept coming up and, you know, and, my kind of textbook answer, well, it does good, right? And uh, but I don't really know that with any certainty. You know, nobody's coming back to me and saying, well, this thing, you know, I put some stones through it and it fell apart. Um, so we we got back to the office and we're and we're kind of just you know reviewing some of the the questions that came up at the show and and uh, and then we thought, well, why don't we just do a rock ejection test, right? Why don't we load this thing up with with you know twenty stones, what it's not meant to be used for, and uh, and see what happens, right? And so we loaded it up and uh, took it out in front of the shop. And uh, so we had 20 stones in there and uh, we we spray painted them all orange and uh, to kind of watch and, and see what they did. We, we brought our drone out and a few different cameras and uh, 
And we fired this thing up. And I tell you, Jared, it made a heck of a racket. And uh, these things are banging you away. And video? Banging. But yeah, we actually, yeah, we've got it loaded up on uh, on our Biospreader website. It's, uh, it's we'll have uh, to get we, that. We'll get, have to get that. Yeah, it's, that up. <laughs> it, it kind of, uh, it, it's uh, basically, a, we call it the rock ejection test, right? And uh, it turned this manure spreader into a, uh, into a, you know, basically a, a large pitching machine for stones, right? In fact, it threw the, the largest stone uh, 105 feet out the back of the machine, right? And so one thing I've learned when you're kind of out working with producers and, and testing, when you, when you think you're standing far enough back, yeah, take yeah, another, times, take another yeah. 10 steps back and you're probably you're probably safe then. Right. So, yeah. but, but it was good. It was, you know, uh, if you get asked the question and you, you know, you really want to be able to stand in front of a guy and say, yeah, you know, you know how does it handle stones? Well, it does good. And he's like, well, how do you know? I said, well, because we put stones in it, we ran That's it through great. and uh, here, here's the video. Right. And, uh, and the machine fared really well. I was really impressed. So. Yeah, you know, and that's it, people that I mean, there's a real demand for that quality. Again, so many of the people that we've had the show, they're kind of in that vein that you're in on different in different sectors that we feature where they make a really high quality product, you know, and not not just like it's on their website that we make quality like they truly make these heavy duty units. And the demand and how well these companies are doing it just it's very consistent because there is such a demand for it because you can't. A lot of these things are a very small piece in a very large operation. They can't afford it to be wrong. They can't afford okay. a chain to save 3% for the chain to break. Like they just can't. Yeah. It's not an option. Um, but it, you mentioned trade shows a couple of times. And I wanted to jump over to something. Um, I think, I believe you call it on, on farm for you. And in this climate where all of a sudden things are opening back up a bit, but was where we couldn't travel. We couldn't go to trade shows. You couldn't talk to people, um, you know, about the rocks right on the floor where they're looking, to, looking you right in the eye. Um, so I think it's, it's an important thing to cover that the Dutch has done. Um, so can you talk us through this on farm for you? Yeah. So on farm for you is uh, essentially it's, you know, we've we've got a fairly large fleet of territory managers that uh, that that are kind of out and about in in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, um, Alberta, in in the northern U.S. And we've always kind of done um, on firm for you, but we've never really kind of we've never really called it anything. We've just we've just it's kind of been a a part of our best practice. If a customer calls, we uh, we do our best to get out to the farm, review the options with them, and uh, and then look at uh, you know offering what we can for support because there's a lot of different ways of doing things out there and everybody's needs are a little bit different. And so, um, you know, when things changed here last, uh, you know, kind of February, March there, uh, we, we got, uh, it, it kind of, everybody's sitting back and thinking, okay, well, what's this really going to look like? How, how are we going to connect with our guys, right? How are we going to connect with producers? Because essentially connecting with people was kind of something that was starting to be frowned upon a little bit right and so we uh we ended up um i, I kind of looked at this and i thought well we've always kind of been on farm for the customers and so why don't we kind of build a bit of a campaign around this and uh yeah. make make these guys aware that we you know what we still want to connect with you guys in, in a safe a safe way and so uh you know there's lots of different restrictions out there and so we kind of promoted on farm for you and we uh we have a booking program that we come out with in in the uh in the winter for uh, kind of up, up to mid December for, for a lot of our uh, agricultural customers on the opener side of things. And we, uh, we put together a bit of a marketing campaign around on farm for you. And, and basically the, you know, with these guys not being able to come see us at trade shows, the goal was to make sure that we were still accessible to them and um, that they had access to our guys. And so they could, you know, we could sit down with them and have the conversations and help them uh, select the right opener for their, uh, for their machine. And so, as uh, as as things kind of evolved in the last year, that you know there were certain different uh, you know rules in each and every province, and uh, so we we did our best to play by those rules and understand uh, you know uh, what we needed to do to to stay safe out there, and and uh, so we you know at, at some point there was uh, there was even a kind of a, a border closure, and uh, uh, Manitoba wasn't really welcoming to to other you know province uh, travel from other provinces, and so. Uh, she had a territory manager head out to meet a gentleman uh, couldn't get right, right to his farm just inside of Manitoba and so uh, they met at the border and they uh, they kind of sat tailgate to tailgate and uh, 
had the conversation that way and, uh, you know, walked some product over and said, here, here you go, have a look at this. And so instead of kind of standing, uh, you know, a couple feet apart, reviewing what, what you're looking at, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, a province apart, so to speak. But uh, um, yeah, you know, you just, you kind of got to be creative. And sometimes it was uh, as simple as dropping product off at, uh, at the end of a guy's driveway for him to, you know, to take and then, uh, you know, go back, play around with it, have a look at it, see how it mocks up and fits on his drill. And then, uh, and then there'd be a follow-up phone conversation after that as to, uh, okay, are you comfortable with what you see? Does this meet your needs? And, uh, is, you know, have we got you all the information you need to, to feel comfortable that, you know, we've got, we've presented you with the right product for, uh, for the, your application, right? So. Yeah. You know, I have a, I have a marketing side of course to me as well. And, um, there was, I'll never forget, uh, Rory, who I, th- I think booked you on the show, actually. Rory mm-hmm. Bamford. Um, I, we were renting a car, and he, I, I'll never forget, it was years ago, but he said, uh, I think he was saying Enterprise. He's like, and they're good. Like, they'll, they'll pick you up. And I said, um, I said, Rory, they all pick you up. <laughs> they, the difference is Enterprise just advertises. And <laughs> sure, right. Their <laughs> slogan. And that's, it's interesting you said, because you've done it for so long. But it really does help, and not just help, on the your company side but it helps the company uh, the customers understand what they can do what they can get from you um mm-hmm. you, if you just assume that they know that you'll come to their gate um it's actually a dangerous assumption because they just might not oh absolutely right and and so it's it's not always kind of oriented strictly around the sale uh of a product it's it's also uh really helped us a lot in uh in just our you know producers have the answers uh to to uh, to a lot of uh, you know problems or pinch points that they have through their operation, right? And and they may not have the exact answer, but they know what the problem is and they know what they would like to see in the end, right? And so a lot of our innovations, in fact, almost all of our innovations have come through um, innovations through the producer, right? Where we sit down with these guys, and sometimes it's as simple as grabbing a a piece of chalk and drawing out on the uh, on the floor in the shop. Well. You know, this opener looks like this, but if, if, if it looked like this and we designed it this way, it might flow soil a little better, maybe be a little more resistant towards plugging. And, uh, you know, it solves my problem. And uh, if it solves his problem and, it's a, and, it, and he's using a machine that has a fairly large market share out there, well, if he's having that problem, maybe, maybe six or right. 10 or, or 100 other guys are having that same issue, right? And so you start kind of, uh, you know, looking through uh common issues that that producers are dealing with um and we kind of slide in as a bit of an aftermarket solution provider right where we where we understand where these problems are we take the information back uh to the plant uh a lot of times our engineers will get out and uh and spend time in the yard you know i uh, i think as a farmer uh um, one of my engineers actually kind of said to me one time he says uh he says, you know, uh, my dad used to always say, he says, if I had the engineer out here that designed this thing, he says, I'd give him a piece of my mind. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, not long after that, it was uh, his son who was the engineer that designed that product and was out on yeah. the farm helping him work through a, a bit probably of, industry, got a piece right? of his mind. <laughs> yeah, I, definitely. Right. But, uh, but it's, it, it's good to remain that, you know, keep that connection strong. Right. We, if we, when you kind of lose focus of that, I, I find that's yeah. where you tend to, you know, if you, if you're fooling, foolish enough to think that your ideas are, uh, and your understanding is better than, than the guys that are actually using the equipment, and then you start kind of building your business and innovating that direction, and yeah. you're not really in tune with what the real problem is, and, and pretty soon you're, you're creating solutions to things that maybe aren't problems or or there isn't a market for, and uh, I, I see that quite a bit in in the industry. And uh, and now you're kind of standing there on an island all by yourself, thinking, "Oh, geez, it, maybe I should have kind of listened to this guy, or I should have maybe had a little closer connection with these guys, so that we actually understand uh, um, what uh, you know what what their problems are, and and getting it right directly from them, and uh, and working with them is is huge, right? So yeah, it's it's a real, it's actually a real. Th- uh, challenge in the end, especially, um, you know, it's one thing if it's sort of, um, you know, personal use products. Um, but when you get into like the commercial, uh, you know, commercial and agriculture, mining, energy, all these sectors, and you will see sort of innovation uh, for the sake of innovation. And it can mm. really, 
it can really mess things up and make it very difficult for operators. I'm sure you see it all the time where something comes and hits the market, but it's just, it's, it was built on a, um, on a cement slab <laughs> where there wasn't yeah. the issues. Um, but you're, but so it's really part of what you're doing to try to, to keep that communication going and it, it must make a huge difference. Yeah, it, it's helped us in a lot of ways, right? And, um, you know, one of the big things uh, that, that, uh, that I, I find is that if, if you, if you kind of, when you stop listening to these guys and you think that maybe, you know, better than the guy that uses it, you're, you're kind of, you've gone off track. Right. And so uh, the, the different ways that we have to connect to these guys is huge. Um, you, you look at, uh, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that we're, that we're perfect by any means, but we do, we do a fair amount of business in, in a lot of different areas uh, in the world, right? Anywhere that they grow crops, we're, we're, uh, we're kind of, you know, connected to in some way, shape or form. And uh, it actually came to our attention here the other day is that we're growing, uh, we're growing our business a, a fair amount overseas. And, uh, um, you know, each year in, in Canada here, we have a, a sales and engineering conference. Uh, actually, we have a couple of them every year where we get together for a couple of days and we sit down uh, one right after seeding where we, where we review everything that's kind of happened, uh, all of our new prototypes that we've ran for the year, how they've functioned, um, new problems that producers are coming up with, uh, problems with our product that, uh, you know, maybe weren't an issue last year, but the conditions are different this year and now they're an issue. And uh, how do we combat that? And, uh, and so uh, we've, we've really strived as well to kind of extend that into our overseas customers. We do quite a bit of business in, uh, in the UK and Australia, France, Germany, Bulgaria, it's, it's, uh, it's quite interesting, uh, you know, just even communicating with, uh, with all these different producers out there and understanding kind of what's important to them and then trying to, trying to build something that is a, a solution for, for the problem that they're experiencing, right? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I've, I've been taught this le lesson multiple times in the show is that you, I look at a company like yours and, you know, you've, you've been around a long time. It's a good sized company, but obviously there's, there's global competitors. I mean, global competitors. It's, it's, mm -hmm. and I go, how do they, and I always am curious, how do they compete at that level? And then once I get to talk to someone like yourself, you start to realize this is how they do it because they've got that edge um, through, through their communication and their R and D, which isn't, even necessarily this official R and D, it's it's this it's actually part of the company, the R and D, which is a thing like uh, like companies like GE back in their heyday, they had that sort of mentality that just they're continuously getting this feed, uh, this feedback filtered through, and it just gives them an edge that that other companies, if you don't have that, you can't really compete on it. I want to talk about something your 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 opener um, because that's sort of. That is one of those products. It's it's very much you know <laughs> literally in the ground, um, and something that you've developed over the years. Can you talk about that? Because I, I think it's sort of I know it's a key part of your business, and and we just haven't really touched on it. So I want to make sure we get yeah, it. yeah. It's it's actually a, it's it's a very key part of our business, Jared. It's uh, our kind of history started with uh, well, no, no different than uh, you know guys coming to us with issues right and this is kind of you're getting into the mid 80s where uh where you know high tillage is still a fairly common practice and we're uh we're now we're dealing with some drought scenarios where uh you know if you turn your soil over too much you're looking at uh your soil getting blown into the neighbor's yard and and the neighbors on down the way and so we're looking at ways of kind of retaining moisture disturbing a little less ground and uh so guys came to us with, uh, you know, different ideas on how we could do that. And so it started kind of in the mid 80s, working with some different producers and uh, some different drill manufacturers that are kind of starting to look at, uh, you know, lower tillage uh, scenarios out there and what we could do to, uh, to kind of adapt farming practices a little bit. And so uh, back in the day, I guess, uh, our, one of our first kind of major ventures was uh, with a company by the name of Frigstad, which turned into Flexico, which was later bought out by Case New Holland, that uh, we were kind of working together with these guys. And for a short time, we had uh, an original equipment kind of an agreement with them that they would purchase our stuff. And then uh, they went on to design their own openers. And uh, so over the years, our, our openers have kind of... Uh, um, evolved as a aftermarket option for producers, right? So when an OEM manufacturer provided you with a, with a seeding tool, here, here's your tool, 
here's how it engages the ground. This is what it looks like. And, and this is kind of what you get. Um, maybe there's one or two options, but a lot of guys were looking for something different, right? Uh, you know, maybe I want to I pl place my seed here. I want my fertilizer here. And uh, so they were coming to us looking for different, you know, uh, stuff that lasted better, uh, stuff that uh, maybe ran at a different angle, disturbed more soil, disturbed less soil, depending on what you're trying to do. And so uh, you start kind of evolving your 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 business around that. You uh, you start evolving your products around that. And, uh, and it kind of just turns into uh, its own little animal, right? We... Uh, Openers is a, is a, for those who aren't really involved in egg business, they, they don't, you know, I, a lot of people think that we build garage door openers when they see the truck parked in front of our house, right? They don't even really know what an opener is, but uh, for us, it's, uh, it's turned into a very large market. Uh, we, we've spent a pile of time trying to understand the science in our R and D uh, we've got a great group of engineers at Dutch that, uh, that put a lot of time into and effort into uh the research and development and kind of creating standard operating procedures on, on all the things that we've learned, documenting everything that we've learned and implementing this into uh, all of our designs uh, going forward is, has been huge for us. We've actually, uh, in the last few years, we've got a few different uh, uh, ways for us to kind of test and, and different tools we use in, in our research and development. And one of them is uh, we built a, a plot drill, which is a a, just a small drill like we're kind of in the fabrication side of things so you know, you know if it's something that we can that can be built out of steel we can build it right and uh, so we built this this plot drill and we named it Clyde and it's it's kind of an ugly thing but it's very functional in what we need it for and uh, what it does is it's uh, it's basically got a couple different uh, uh, two uh, options to set shanks on it we can put shanks on from pretty much any drill manufacturer and and simulate uh, you know, uh, a Borgo drill, a seed hawk drill, a seed master drill, uh, a John Deere drill, and and attach all these uh, row units to this uh, to this test test piece that we have, and uh, and then go out and, and try different things with it. Right? We've got uh, some some land secured southeast of Regina where we uh, where we do a lot of that testing throughout the summer, and it just uh, it really kind of helps us learn a lot. Right? It, you, there's, you know, you, you, you learn a pile during seeding when you're working with producers, but, uh, but if you have the ability to test that stuff year round and, uh, and play with it in, you know, all different types of conditions, uh, some years is wet. Uh, so we've got some sloughs that we can, you know, pull it through to, to try and emulate really wet conditions and, and plugging conditions and, uh, how are our openers going to perform there? And it's, uh, it's given us some good flexibility, uh, um, we've got a, a very large uh, soil bin that we're in the process of kind of putting together right now that that we can run um, openers essentially year round at Dutch and, and do a lot of different fatigue testing and wear testing with that. Um, this unit is quite uh, it's quite the beast and it's a it's a very large uh, uh, rotary soil bin that uh, that you can essentially you know if you want to know what it, it's like to to be in a rocky field you can you can chuck rocks into this thing and right. it can, you know run around and have these things bounce and bang off of it and uh and simulate a, a lot of different real life uh you know farming seeding scenarios right so is that like i i just want to understand for these openers the are is it like uh, i'm sorry for the lame i think i apologize in every show for the for these types of questions <laughs> but does it come down to I mean the the angle that the the carbide tip is at like like what what is the what are the adjustments that you're making in these testing or is it that last year someone else um someone um you know is trying to do something different so then you kind of got to rework it like what sort of what are the scenarios where you're where you're making adjustments on these units well there's a lot of different uh reasons why we kind of look at uh, at, at changing our openers and I guess to give you a few examples is uh, there's changes by the manufacturer where they'll come up with a different design or a different row unit that that functions different than it has in the past um, so we we need to design and build around that uh, a lot of it is is kind of the needs of the of the producer and what they're trying to do right and so when we're when we're working on uh, trying to find the right opener for the right application we've uh, we've kind of narrowed it down to you know, seven different things that we kind of go through with the producer. And I won't go through all those with you here today, but the biggest thing I find is understanding what their needs are. This is the, this is the unit that you have 
Um, what are the limitations around that unit? What are the limitations around the land that you're seeding into? And what are you trying to do? So if, if you want your seed here and your fertilizer here, you've got a uh, 10 inch row spacing. How do we place it where we want it to go without throwing too much soil over the next row, getting adequate separation so that your seed is, is safe from your fertilizer, um, but, but still, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the fertilizer is still plant available and it's close enough to, uh, to, to kind of close enough, but not too close. And, uh, you know, there's lots of different factors into it. Like, uh, um, in, you know, we call it trash, but it's basically the, the kind of the remaining crop from the previous year that's, that's sitting in the field. You know, how do we uh, look at innovations for the producer that, that allows that trash to flow through the machine better so it doesn't build up and then you have to lift all your shanks up, circle around go back in, release that trash and, and hopefully not build up again, right? And so um, stuff that works in wet conditions, uh, when you're trying to make tight turns in the field, how do you not get the inside wing to plug uh, as it starts to almost go backwards as you're making that turn, right? Uh, so there's lots of different kind of driving factors that, that drive our innovations, but, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we try and work through them and uh, understand where mo you know a, a lot of guys are feeling similar uh, similar you know uh, having similar struggles with the product and then uh, kind of trying to innovate around that right so yeah. it's it's very you know for for me it as, as you were t explaining through I thought yeah, like I mentioned the beginning of the show I've on in the ag sector I've always sort of been on the outside looking in you know know a few guys that have ranches and things like that and but but you know my sister's up on a ranch and but um it's sort of it's it's sort of amazing to be able to make a living off getting people to explain the things that I've as I drive by I'm trying to figure out in two minutes what this is. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I I'm I'm hoping the other thing that came to my mind is uh, that sales and engineering meeting that you have at the year that would be a fascinating um, to maybe get a couple people on <laughs> the show from your team you and maybe the engineer to talk through that sort of that year review, that'd be quite interesting to see what kind of that feedback and then the design. Yeah. Is. Um, I'm just trying to get you back on the show, essentially. Yeah, no, and, and fair enough. Uh, you know, it, it, it's an interesting dynamic between sales and engineering and, uh, and marketing and uh, sales and engineering, you know, they all play a very, uh, you know, integral role in the company, uh, but they all come with their own, uh, dynamic, I guess is a good way to explain it. Right. Um, sales is a lot of times go, go, go. Uh, engineering yeah. is, uh, is very, uh, you know, interested in innovation, but at a, at a pace that they're comfortable with. Right. And, uh, and then, uh, and then marketing is, uh, is kind of leaning on both to, uh, to, you know, to help, uh, figure out ways to get that message across to the customer. And so, um, yeah, we've had a few, uh, fairly, uh, interesting engineering conferences over the years and, sure. uh, you know, I, I can kind of think back to one where uh, where I was a little unhappy with uh, the way we had something designed, and I'm uh, I'm trying to explain it to the engineers. And so, um, you know, I, I it was it was the way a, a hose attaches to an opener, and I'm sure these guys weren't real impressed with me at that time because I was kind of letting them have it. And uh, and uh, I, I said, okay, guys, this is this is picture of this, and I I pulled the chair out that I was sitting on, and I said, okay. I went and laid underneath that chair on my, on the side of my, you know, on my side. And I'm, I said, okay, you, you guys can, can put this together real quick and simple when it's sitting on a test stand up in front of you now lay on your side underneath the chair and uh, you know, try not to crack your head on all those little sharp yeah. steel objects yeah. underneath there. You know, the wind's blowing in your face and everything's caked up and, and built up and the seized dog, together. The dog's jumping in, trying to get in the totally. way. Totally. And, and now you do it. And, and you tell me yeah. if this is easy. And if you think this is easy, maybe I got it wrong. Right. And they, uh, I don't think they were real appreciative of my approach, but, uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, putting yourself in the, in the shoes of, of the producer and what's that experience like for these guys. Right. And, uh, um, our engineering team is awesome. I don't, I don't want to throw these guys on the bus by any means. We've, uh, they, they put together some really good, uh, standard practices, which has, uh, really driven down our warranty costs. Um, uh, we're at the point where uh, our warranty is uh, is very very respectable within the industry, right? There's uh, a lot of times it's not so much now a matter of uh, of did it did the product fail due to an engineering or a design uh, flaw. It's more so uh, uh, you, we're kind of looking at warranty as 
almost in a in a one off scenario where did it not perform up to your expectations? Is there something that I can maybe get you out of this product into okay. another product? And uh, we kind of call that the gray area where it's not that the product isn't isn't functioning as it was designed. It may not just be the best uh, you know product for that producer's application. And so we work with those guys and try and get them in something that uh, that maybe is a little bit better for them and. Uh, We'll, we'll meet their needs better going forward, right? So it's it's sort of I, I will say, and I don't, I don't know how much of it is on pur- purpose or just just natural ability, but it, it's sort of neat how you be able to talk about the technical so- side, but right from the beginning of where the company started and sort of weave the story of the company through it, and sort of that communication, that business development. It, it's quite interesting, and I was thinking while you were talking <coughs> about that relationship between engineers and sales and marketing. I know a lady who literally has made her career off of coming into companies and helping the engineering and sales department communicate. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not just, it's, it's every industry has that, that gap and they need to sort of try to find that. Sometimes it's middle ground, sometimes no, it's not. One of them has to be right. You know, best practices for the engineer, um, making it functional on, in real life application for the sales, you know, that sort of stuff. It just has to go. Well, you're right, Jared. Actually, the struggle is quite real. I uh, It kind of takes me to a little bit of a story. Uh, one of our lead engineers, are, uh, him and I often joke about uh, the, the uh, I guess, the, <laughs> the communication uh, of an engineer versus the communication of a sales, sales guy, right? And so we, we often discuss uh, the differences in the two. And then uh, a lot of times when we're looking at the new engineers, we, uh, we interview together. And, uh, yeah. and so we... Uh, when we have uh, uh, you know a, a potential uh, engineer that we're interviewing, and uh, you know, and they leave the room, and and I look over at uh, my colleague, and I say, okay, well, what, what did you think? And he's like, well, yeah, it looks good, and I'm comfortable with what I saw. And he's like, well, I know you like him already because he can talk well, right? And so <laughs> I said, well, yeah, it's uh, you know, and sometimes it engineers go, you know, maybe are are kind of driven by different things, right? At, for for me, I feel fairly comfortable. I'm a fairly natural communicator, but you know, if, if you're not that, then maybe your your path or your career path is is chosen because you're, uh, you know, maybe you're com- more comfortable sitting in front of a computer, putting together different designs, and working through those scenarios where there's maybe a little less communication and uh, uh, and more uh, critical thinking and uh, and the like, right? And so. Uh, we often joke about that around the office and uh, we've got a few, uh, a few guys that kind of like to do their own thing. And, uh, and then other guys that, uh, that are, are kind of doing their own thing as far as engineering goes, but uh, uh, also communicate really well. And so it's uh, yeah, it's kind of a bit of a go and joke around the office. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it, I, I find it lots of fun to actually see it. And, and I will throw it out there that some of our top shows have been, they're, they're not guys that make a living off communicating but people just love those episodes because they're yeah. so, they're so knowledgeable about technical stuff and, and people, it's like your videos showing how it's, you know, it's just a simple video showing how to take the pin out and which different uh, pin drives you need to, to remove it. But it's so helpful when you get that good technical understanding from someone. Um, yeah. It's, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show. I, I do. I really do hope you come back, Jason. Um, yeah. It's the, the company the company i just when, when someone comes on and represents a company so well and you see and they've got so much behind it something as simple as these well not that simple but testing those you know through the rocks and answering those customer questions and and this is not just something you had on air this is something you were talking about as soon as we started uh, prepping for the interview so uh, i'm very happy to have dutch industries on i, I hope you come back and uh, we're just getting into the first couple episodes of crowns Meg. um so i hope you get to uh, keep being a part of it yeah, well, it's, uh, we appreciate you having us as well here, Jared. It's been great uh, kind of sitting down and uh, discussing stuff with you. You know, it, we, we're pretty passionate people in the ag world. Uh, you, you get into, uh, you know, through Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, and the northern part of the U.S. and kind of that grain belt there. Uh, there's a lot of proud people and there's a lot of really good innovation uh, that happens. Uh, you know, I, I was kind of speaking to uh, to Rory, your, 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 uh, your counterpart there, and I said, you know, if you guys are 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 real interested in, uh, in in kind of promoting egg, there there's a lot of really good innovation that happens here in Saskatchewan, and a lot of great ideas that come out of this province. And so, uh, yeah, we're proud to be a part of that, and uh, um, yeah, we want to keep going and uh, keep working with uh, with producers to understand the issues that we can help them with, and uh, and uh, yeah, take take that type type of stuff to market, and 
and uh, yeah, just kind of do what we can to uh, to you know fit in along the way, right? So. Yeah, and you know what? It's kind of a it's kind of a humbling thing when we sit here in our little studio in Vancouver, which is not where you'd see an egg show coming out of. Probably uh, you wouldn't assume it would be produced out of there. But we learned if you show if you show an interest, you don't need to be the expert. The, we're we're talking to the experts. But if you show a genuine interest and and actually are engaged in their industries, people from anywhere. We've had people from all over the world come on the show now. Um, people want to talk about their industries. They want to share their knowledge. They want to get their company out there. Um, so it's pretty exciting to see where this, where this will go. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks again for having me, Jared. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, and, uh, we'll have lots of links and everything in the show. Um, I'm going to do a quick sign off to the audience as well, but, uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you everybody for watching. Um, I, you know, I, I don't even quite know why yet, but I just, it's, it's lots of fun doing these egg shows. Um, I think it's kind of growing, like I said, a couple of times the show that outside looking in on the industry. So it's kind of fun for me to just be able to get into something I, I haven't been able to. Um, you can, uh, you can follow our show. You can, you know, Google Crownsman Partners, Crownsman Egg, um, the Crownsman Show, lots of stuff comes up. LinkedIn, YouTube, um, Gaudi is much better at, at listing them all off. We also have um, on all the uh, podcast channels like Spotify and things like that. You can uh, catch us on there. Thank you for watching, everybody. Keep suggesting guests. Thank you again to our sponsors. Thank you, everybody, for watching. See you on the next episode of Crownsman Egg.